Hello, everyone. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. My name is Sylvia Levy, and I'm the Communications Officer for the ANH Academy and the IMANA program based at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Thank you very much for joining us on this webinar today, co-hosted by the ANH Academy and GIZ about how to use formative research to redesign your SBC strategy. It's the third out of five in our webinar series on social and behavioral change for improved agriculture and nutrition. The Agriculture, Nutrition, and Health Academy brings together researchers, practitioners, and policymakers working for better nutrition and health through improved agriculture and food systems. With members from over 100 countries, the ANH Academy is a global network and platform for sharing research and evidence, capacity strengthening, and collaboration across diverse disciplines. If you are not a member yet, we encourage you to sign up and join the Academy on our website after this webinar, as well as convening working groups, hosting webinars like this one, and curating a blog. We also have an annual meeting of the Agriculture, Nutrition, and Health community called the ANH Academy Week. We held this year's conference, ANH 2020, just a few months ago online, and we invite you to explore conference resources, presentation videos, recordings of all live sessions, and the newly published ANH 2020 report. Now over to our moderator, Cecilia Gonzalez, co-leader of the ag to newt community of practice. Thank you, Sylvia. So today, we will be discussing how to use formative research to redesign your SBC strategy. And I will start by introducing our presenters. We have with us today, Naomi Habu Ibrahim. She is the health and nutrition manager for Save the Children Niger. And she has more than 15 years of health and nutrition experience and facilitates social and behavior change uh, in rural communities. She currently supports the Wadata team in implementing an SBC strategy in the Zinder region of Niger. We also have with us Lynette Golden. She is the Nutrition SBC Advisor at Save the Children and has supported multiple teams to conduct formative research and develop and implement SBC strategies. She co-authored Save the Children's Focus Tool, an online strategy planner for social and behavior change and communication. And uh, last but not least, we have Megan Pollack. She's the Senior Nutrition SBC Specialist at Save the Children, supports teams in Burkina Faso, Niger, Mali, in conducting SBC formative research and creating integrated user-friendly SBC strategies. She also promotes capacity building and social support of community members using participatory-based tools such as the Community Action Cycle methodology. So we're excited to have them three today to work as a dynamic team for this presentation. And uh, I will pass it on to our presenters. Welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm Lynette and today we're going to share how to develop a social and behavior change strategy. Uh, along the way, we'll be sharing concrete examples from a strategy we just finished uh, putting together for the Wadata program in Niger. This is Meg Pollack. i um, happy to be here with you today. Hello, this is Naomi. We are excited to be with you all here. The outline uh, or the, the process that we used is based on this uh, tool that Save the Children developed called Focus. Um, it's a strategy planner online uh, and it can be found on the Healthy uh, Newborn Network. Um, and uh, we plan to uh, update it sometime in the, in the near future. You don't have to use a tool like Focus to develop your SBC strategy. There are many different guides and tools that exist that are similar, that have similar uh, steps and tools. But today we're going to be presenting just some of the steps and the tools uh, that are in uh, this Focus online uh, strategy planner. So let's talk about this five-step process uh, that's in focus. Now, it was adapted from several similar, similar processes used in uh, social behavior change, such as the P process developed by Johns Hopkins University Center for Communication Programs, the C planning for SBCC, uh, or the C change planning tool, um, 
was developed by the Sea Change Project, and also the behavior centered design process developed by Anger and, and Curtis at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. So each step in the process builds on previous steps. So step one, assessment. So in this step, uh, you, you start to understand the situation, and it's, it's so critical to do this. In this step, you're going to conduct an assessment and a situation, situational analysis, and the data you analyze will um, assist to really help formulate your problem statement um, to help focus your program design. In step two, the behavioral focus step, um, this second step will help you draft a theory of change, identify and segment key audiences, uh, identify desired behaviors and key barriers and facilitators, or what we would call determinants. Uh, it'll help you develop measurable SP objectives and guide the strategy with an overarching strategic approach that links all platforms, channels, and activities into a coordinated effort with a certain intensity to affect change. Um, step three is the creative process. And the third step will help you plan effective activities and support materials based on your SVP strategy and participatory processes engaging audiences really right from the start. Step four is delivery. And in this fourth step, you create a, a SVC implementation plan which details the who, what, when, where, and how much of your SVC program. This includes developing a plan to synchronize the timing of the activity to mutually reinforce each other. And then in the final step, step five, evaluation. In this last step, you're going to generate monitoring evaluation output and outcome indicators with, um, from your SVC objectives and also based on your key determinants of change that you identified in step two. Developing an SBC strategy is an iterative process and it really requires you to align data and information and then go back and refine the strategy. The art pertains to what you bring to the process, your ability to apply your SBC knowledge to complex problems, your diagnostic capabilities, and your ability to synthesize knowledge to find effective tipping points or something that pushes an individual com or community or society into action to trigger or maintain social and behavior change with a variety of audiences. Now you might be asking why we're showing a photo with different tools on it and the reason is that it takes a variety of tools to develop a SVP strategy. So just like it takes a variety of tools to build a house, it also takes a variety of tools to develop an SBC. And as I mentioned, each step in the process builds on previous steps and is accompanied by tools that guide the development of the SBC strategy. For instance, formative research is used to complete the situational analysis, problem tree, and problem statement in step one. You then can take the information and develop a theory of change. And once you have segmented your audience and figured out what behaviors to focus on and the barriers and the facilitators of those behaviors and come up with your SBC objectives, you can move to, on to step three and come up with the act activity and so on and so forth. So for this presentation, we are going to use the SBC strategy that we put on the Wedata project as an example. The U.S. Agency for International Development funds the Wadata Development Food Security Projects, which translates to prosperity in Hausa through the Office of Food for Peace. It is implemented by a consortium uh, led by Save the Children with partners. The project's goal is to, to system sustainably uh, improved food and nutrition security and resilience among extremely poor and chronically vulnerable households and communities in the Zinder region of Niger. So Wadata targets 711 villages in Bure and Damagaram Takaya districts in Zinder region of Niger. 
Actually, and so what that is a huge, huge project, but what we're talking about today can be used for a very small project or, uh, or a large one like Wadata. Um, as you can see here, Wadata is focused on seven different topical areas, making it a very complex project. Um, and that's why we're calling this uh, integrated SP strategy. Um, and with so much to cover, um, we needed to find some answers. So in total, Wadata conducted uh, a lot of formative research, nine formative research studies um, that included the cost of diet and doing analysis on gender and youth, wash markets and crops and livestock. Um, and SB, uh, Wadata's SBC formative research findings were also triangulated with all those nine formative research studies, or rather the eight. So even though we're presenting an example of a very complex project, we don't want that to um, throw you off. You could use the same uh, process that we're presenting today, even for a much smaller project. And in planning the formative research, we had to ask where to begin. We knew that we had to investigate a variety of behaviors to understand why they were happening, and then try to figure out what may influence them. We took a problem-solving mindset and tried to get away from those preconceived ideas and go to SP interventions like just providing people with information and instead we tried to approach SBC uh, as a holistic effort addressing all the possible psychological and social and structural factors that the um, diagnosis uh, put forward so we started by assuming we knew nothing at all and made no assumption and then we tried to figure it all out. That's right, Lynette. So um, I know that both Naomi and Lynette have already said this, but the Wadata project is a really big project. It's a $50 million project with many different focus areas. Um, and because of this, we had to conduct this rather large SBC formative research. Um, but even though the project is so large, um, and we actually didn't have a lot of internal expertise in formative research, we were able to pull off this whole study and save some money in the process by not having to hire an outside consultant. So in the span of a week, we were able to train 30 new research assistants who also went on to serve as the project's polyvalent agents or field agents uh, during implementation. Um, and so this training actually served as an onboarding for our staff. Um, and I, I know that uh, 11 tools may sound like a lot, and I, I guess it is, but um, all these tools that we used were very participatory and user-friendly. Um, and under a week, we were able to train all of these polyvalent agents. And in just two weeks, uh, we were able to conduct uh, the work at the field level and reach about 1,300 research participants in uh, Zendare. So the reason I just wanted to give you a bit of background uh, on this formative research is that when you use simple participatory methodologies, it's possible to conduct a larger formative research internally, uh, even when you don't have a lot of resources. Uh, so your projects can do this too, even if they're smaller, uh, you could use only, you know, some of the methodologies that we have. So uh, as Lynette said too, what was also great is that Wadata conducted a lot of other uh, formative research studies. So we were able to triangulate the data and it really provided, you know, that data we needed to guide our um, implementation. So if you're interested in learning more about uh, the formative research methodologies that we used, I know the ANH Academy is putting uh, the guides on their website and they're available in both uh, English and French. So in step one, we developed a situ situational analysis, problem tree, problem statement, and also a list of additional research needs. So we're gonna go through all of these steps in more detail, but let's just start by thinking of step one as the foundation of your strategy. So just like uh, when you're building a house, you need a really solid foundation. Um, so an SBC strategy also needs a solid foundation of research and analysis. Um, so now let's go through each one of these tools uh, that we use for the Wadata strategy. This is the integrated framework that we used um, to help us start making sense of all of our data. Uh, the framework is based on the socio-ecological model uh, that suggests an individual's behavior is influenced and shaped by interactions with different actors and structures in the social environment. And that's what you can see in the rings here and different types of determinants. So that's what you see in uh, the colored tags. Um, and this, this uh, framework is based on theory and current, current peer-reviewed literature. What is a determinant? So 
We know that countless factors from knowledge to motivation, current attitudes, local material conditions, social support, social norms, uh, can all influence behavior change. So we looked at determinants because we know they influence social and behavior change. Please note that the four sets of determinants, they're not meant to be exhaustive. However, there is a set of social and behavioral determinants that is based on theories of behavioral prediction and theories of behavior change. Um, predictive theories of social and behavior change that address why, why people ch uh, change their behavior. Um, there's also a set of community capacity strengthening determinants that can be used if your problem is related more to the capacity or leadership of communities to mobilize for collective action creating demand at the community level or strengthening the linkage between facility and community um, to, uh, you would use these uh, determinants in, in the blue. And if you're focusing on pro provider behavior change or increasing community health workers performance, um, there are some determinants here in gray that would help uh, may better describe issues with quality service delivery. And lastly, we wanted a way to measure resilience. Um, resilience being the ability of, of people, households, communities, countries, systems to mitigate, adapt to, recover from shocks and stresses um, in a manner that reduces chronically vulner uh, vulnerability and facilitates inclusive growth. So we included a set of resilience determinants that you see here on the right. And what we did is we took um, the determinants from the other three sets and combined them. And of course, this was all based on, on literature. So let's pause here for just a second and get some feedback from all of you in the audience. Um, can you think of any determinants that influence social and behavior change? And we're keeping this very open. We just want you to think about any determinants that can influence social and behavior change. And you can just type those responses right in the chat box. Social norms, great. Social norms with an exclamation mark. <laughs> Tradition, habits. Yes. Wow, I think we've got some, some experts in the room, Wadata team. This is a great list. This is yeah. going to help us uh, guide our, our project even more. Gender, cultural beliefs, divinity, peer pressure, religious leaders. Great. Oh, this yeah. is a long, long list. We love this. We love this feedback. Yeah, it looks like people are getting the hang of it. Great. Okay, so let's, let's move along, um, and you can continue writing some of those answers in the chat box. That'll be helpful to us later on. Yeah, so the first thing that we need to do when we go to develop an SBC strategy is to complete a situational analysis. And uh, to do this, you need to review the existing data about a problem's context to better understand the opportunities, barriers to change, and challenges for the problem which you're trying to solve. You can do a desk review of the existing liter literature to help you answer questions about the context in which the program will take place. Um, so just a few questions uh, that, that can help you kind of think about, think through your situational analysis. So um, at the individual level, uh, what are the current practices? What are different individuals practicing, right? We can leave that kind of open. What are they doing? What are they not doing? Um, at the interpersonal level, consider the people who indirectly influence uh, those individuals, right? So we can think of partners, um, you know, uh, mothers-in-law, fathers-in-law, traditional leaders, um, and how do they support or prevent the primary audience from adopting uh, the positive behavior? And also, who does the uh, primary audience trust and go to for support? Um, at the community level, what types of uh, community health service delivery is available in the community? What are the current strengths and challenges? Uh, what are the kinds of activities taking place in community capacity strengthening or community mobilization in the intervention area? Uh, what are some of the strategies uh, being undertaken and what are some of those outcomes of these efforts? So the situational analysis can also be a chance to learn more about the community structures, how communities are organized, the formal and informal leadership structures, and how decisions are made and, and who makes them. Uh, program staff will need to know the answers to these questions before they begin implementation. Um, and beginning community dialogue around these issues will also help build this mutual trust um, 
between the program staff and the communities. The next step um, in completing the situational analysis is to work through a problem tree. So a problem tree is a planning tool used to analyze uh, a situation and it includes the direct and indirect and underlying causes of problems in the given context. So uh, I've seen some projects develop problem tree graphics that are actual trees um, with the core problem being in the center of the trunk um, and the un indirect and underlying causes being represented by the roots of the tree and the effects being represented by the leaves or the, the branches. So if that visual is easier for you, you can certainly go with that. Um, but we found this visual here on the screen a bit easier for us because it aligns with the colors of the different determinants also used in our SBC framework. Um, so again, a problem tree really helps to provide more co a comprehensive view of the causes, possible effects, and ways to address the problem and situation most effectively based on data. So comprehensive strategies like the Wadata SBC strategy combine determinants from the four sets of determinants onto this one problem tree. And when filling out your problem tree, be sure to use data to back up um, anything that you put on here, right? So any data from your formative research or secondary uh, data. The next step is the problem statement. Um, a problem statement is just a brief summary of the behavioral problem that you want to address. Um, the problem statement could briefly summarize what you found from completing the situational analysis. analysis. So let's just uh, quickly kind of go through this. Uh, we use the situational assessment to start thinking about what actions are needed to address the issues. So for instance, in the case of implementing the Wadata strategy, gender inequality uh, limits opportunities for women and girls as well as puts pressure on men and boys. Uh, and these inequalities are reinforced by discriminatory systems and structures that prevent women and girls from reaching their full potential. So given this, we decided uh, we need to develop a platform for smaller group discussion, mentoring, and dialogue to explore, challenge, and change harmful norms, and finally to build locally grown solutions. So these are just on the screen a few questions you can ask that will help you build up your own problem statement for your strategy. So. Keeping with the analogy that building a house is a lot like developing an SBC strategy, we've now laid the foundation with our situational analysis, etc. And now it's time to give your strategy a uh, structure and shape. So in step two, you will start to develop that strategy based on what you learned from the situational analysis, as Lynette just, just pointed out. So the first thing you will need to do is develop a theory of change that will explicitly lay out your assumptions about how the end result, in this case, social and behavior change, how that, how that is going to be achieved. So after that, you will decide how to segment your audience and then outline the types of desired behaviors, barriers, and facilitators to change. Uh, your focus will be on the behaviors and norms you need to address and on the audience and their way of doing things. So you will need to tailor your strategy to reach your audience, uh, to move them and motivate them to begin and maintain change. So it's really important to remember that, you know, we're giving you all the tools here and a one size fit all, fits all approach doesn't work for SBC, right? Yeah, that's true. Um, so the first task in step two is to develop a theory of change. And here you can see um, a simple template that we've, we've provided. A theory of change shows the pathways of change by clearly stating how program activities and outputs will help reach desired outcomes. In other words, a theory of change is an idea of how you will affect change um, based on your problem statement. So to start, uh, we like to work backwards from um, the final anticipated results or outcome. Uh, and then we then you can ask yourself, what change is your primary audience or community or service uh, health system or national level change? What, what is it that, um, you anticipate as a result of your program activities. Then you'll formulate assumptions on how you expect the behavior change to be achieved in terms of social behavioral outputs and think about what inputs or interventions uh, need to be made to achieve that. And then in the fourth uh, uh, column here, um, you, you have to be careful because all too often program planners focus on the individual and increasing people's knowledge about benefits or 
of a behavior or the consequence of not taking action. But we know that a lack of knowledge is usually not the biggest barrier. So focusing your intervention solely on increasing knowledge will do little to change behavior. And that's why it's important to make sure your assumptions are backed up on evidence. Um, and it's also important to, um, again, think about the socio-ecological model and all the different um, st structural and social uh, barriers and facilitators. So let's look at this example here. So this is not from Wadata. This is actually from a maternal and um, newborn health project. Um, but it's a simple theory of change. So, um, and it's, it's based on the model I just showed you. Um, so let's just take a look at it. So again, the starting from the right and going left, um, here they wanted to reduce maternal newborn um, health morbidity and mortality. That was what they wanted to do. Um, in order to do that, at the individual level change, um, they wanted to increase practice of appropriate maternal in um, newborn health behaviors at the household level. And they also wanted to increase um, maternal and newborn health um, care seeking. Um, and then um, at the normative change, so at that social change level, they wanted to improve service delivery at the community and facility levels. And um, they wanted to make sure that communities were uh, actively addressing um, all the different issues. They also wanted to increase social support for women and families. Um, and so you can see the interventions um, were a range of different things. It wasn't just one thing. So this is a, just a simple template you can uh, use when you start thinking about your theory of change. Um, and of course, you know, there's a whole plethora of different uh, models you could, you could use, but we just wanted to show you the simple one. The next thing that uh, we want to tell you about is the audience segmentation. So audience segmentation is a key activity that divides a larger group of individuals into smaller segments with similar needs, values, or characteristics. So I know that some of this was covered in the last two webinars, so it might be a, rev it might be a review for some of you. Um, but segmentation recognizes that uh, different groups will respond differently to social and behavior change activities and uh, support materials. So segmenting allows a program to focus on those audience audiences who are most critical to reach and to design the most effective and efficient strategy for helping each audience adopt new behaviors. So you're not going to be able to reach everyone in the same way, right? Um, your SBC strategy will require different strategies, channels, activities, and materials for each one of these audiences. Um, so the idea is to really narrow down the audience into a distinct group, but one still big enough uh, to create a level of change that you want for the project. So for example, women of reproductive age can be segmented by age, number of children, uh, if they live in urban or rural settings, what motivates them? Do they use family planning or not? It depends on the behavior and the strategy that you're trying to, to uh, create. But the key is really to make sure there is a reason for why you're creating this audience segmentation. Some reason this audience needs to be addressed differently from everybody else. So as you can see here, there's three different types of audiences. So first there's the directly affected audience, also known as the, the primary audience. And these are the individuals or groups uh, who are the most important to reach to bring about change. And then we've got the direct influencers that we also call second, the secondary audience. And these are individuals or groups uh, who play a key role in influencing the primary audience, either positively or negatively. And you know, we found that this group can be really important in um, changing behaviors, since sometimes the primary audience has little agency, agency to change themselves. And this was the case for Wadata. We found this. Uh, then you've got the indirect influencers that we also call the tertiary audience, audience. And these are individuals or groups who indirectly influence the primary audience by shaping social norms, influencing policy, and sometimes offering financial or logistical support uh, to community members. So this group could be formal or informal civil society NGOs, faith-based groups, community and business leaders. It could even be a, a sports entertainer or an author. Okay, so for Wadata, we, we have a... Uh, quite the list of different audience members since it's such a big project. So I'm not going to go into all those details right now, but I'll just name a few just to give you an idea. So some of the primary audiences that um, 
We are working with our women of reproductive age in rural settings, 18 to 24, couples in rural settings, 18 to 35, um, and men, 18 to 24 in rural settings. Um, and a key uh, secondary audience or direct influencer that we, we found was really important to work with were religious leaders. This is a very um, traditional Muslim society. So we found that, that the religious leaders have a lot of influence. Um, and then for a tertiary audience, uh, one that we cited was working at the commune level. So working with town, the town hall, because the town hall offers certain financial support to different community platforms. Also, I just wanted to point out that this is, uh, this is the Compass website, and it's a curated collection of social and behavior change how-to guides. And we found that the, that how, the how to do audience segmentation guide here is really, really helpful, so definitely check it out. You're all going to get a copy of the, um, the PowerPoint, and the link is embedded in the, the PowerPoint, so, so please give it a look. The next step in the process is to identify what behaviors you will prioritize for your primary audience. Um, a desired behavior is the key action that we want the audience to do. And also, this was covered so uh, in the previous uh, webinar in this series, so if you'd like to learn more about it on how to select behaviors, um, please listen to the recording on the, uh, of the second webinar in this series on social behavior change for improved agriculture and nutrition. Um, so after you know what behaviors you want to focus on, you'll identify what present or what prevents or encourages the primary audience to practice the desired behavior. Um, this was also covered, um, so I won't go into great detail here. Now, with data collected data on barriers and facilitators during the SBC and other formative research. Um, and as we've mentioned, barriers and facilitators come in many forms, emotional, social, structural, educational, and even habits. Um, for WADADA, we use um, the SAVE's integrated SBC framework to classify the barriers and facilitators. So for example, um, discriminatory, uh, discriminatory social norms and gender-based barriers and gaps affect all aspects of health, nutrition, food security, agriculture, livelihoods, and resilience in the region. It really affects everything. And um, some of the participants stated that some of the most significant barriers to health services is distance to the health facility, um, transportation costs, and cost of cares. Additionally, participants commented that most people in the region have little uh, or no exposure to health care. So these are some of the things we had to um, keep in mind. And the next thing we did um, after we did all this research is we defined our SBC objectives. Um, and SBC objectives specify the kind and amount of respect for a specific population within a given period of each intervention. Be sure to base your objectives on the barriers you need to decrease and the facilitators you need to increase. And make sure your objectives are smart, right? Specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time specific. Um, the objective, your objective, should really only state the results to be achieved, not the process or the activities that you're going to use to perform it. Um, so in this example, um, uh, we start, uh, and I, I've given you uh, a kind of a, a template to use with, you would start with the word to, um, followed by an action verb, and the amount of change you expect to achieve for a specific population, or you could use the formula of, uh, by the end of, blah, 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 there will be an increase of a specific audience who does whatever. So in this example here on the bottom um, in yellow, um, I've written out uh, the start, I guess, of a SBC objective. Um, that is to increase the demand and use of agricultural services by women. And so our question for you to put in the chat box uh, is how would you make this statement into a SMART objective? How would you make it um, specific and measurable, um, time-specific? 
how could you do that? So maybe take uh, a minute to write in the chat box any ideas you have. Yeah, someone's saying add time or percent. Mm -hmm. So you, you could increase the demand and use of agricultural services by women by say 30%. Um, uh, by in, in the first year of services or something like that. Mm -hmm. At a target. Ah, define what demand means. Yes, that's good, Kath Catherine. Mm -hmm. Add time. Carolyn's talking about uh, be specific about groups of women um, and which services. Mm -hmm. Add the time frame. Yeah. Demand for what? Yes. So we have to be a little bit more specific about that. Mm hmm. Great. So I think you're you're getting the hang that you're getting the hang of it for sure. Um. So now we're going to move on to step three. So in the last step, uh, you determined who you will be working with through your audience segmentation and what you want to achieve through the written objectives, right? So what we just did. So you can think of step three as the step where you get to tailor your approach, right? You get to have a little fun here. Um, like when you're building a house, uh, this is the time where you get to customize the color of paint you wanna use, maybe what furniture you want, uh, what color blinds you want, maybe you wanna throw a solar panel on the roof, you know, you get, you get the idea, right? So this is where we get to do that in our strategy. So here you can determine which activities or interventions will be used for each audience to achieve the communication objectives, as well as which channels and materials will support the activities and reach the audience. So you will also need to decide your overall strategic approach, which holds together all the different channels, activities, and messages so that they can be recognized as one cohesive SBC strategy. So rather than impose uh, predetermined behavior change activities, and support materials onto communities, now is the time in the strategy development process to start to collaborate closely with your partners, and that includes the, the community members, right? To identify activities that will address problems, goals, objectives, mobilize resources, and develop support materials that will help you achieve those goals. So also it's really important to remember to align all of your efforts with any ongoing activities where you plan to work, such as any activities by the Ministry of Health or other organizations like UNICEF, WHO. I know that uh, where we are um, in Zindere, Niger, there's a, some other USAID partners that are working in the zone. So we make sure to, uh, sh we've, our, we've made sure to share our SBC strategy with some of those partners, get their input, um, and also work with them on certain activities at the, the field level. Notice how we didn't start with activities, right? We, we actually started with talking about the audience, then brought about the behaviors, and then we started talking about activities. So when we talk about activities in an SBC strategy, it comes more towards the end. Um, and here, I just we just put up a few examples of some SBC approaches that you could use. Um, and these are some approaches that we used under Wadata. So just remember that each approach here has its strengths and weaknesses that must be matched to the program objectives. Um, and few, few approaches are sufficient alone, so they must be worked, worked in combination with uh, some other approaches. A strategic approach is at the heart of the SBC strategy. So this, what this does is it ties together the different interventions, channels, and support materials and packages them into a synergistic program. For instance, uh, Wadata's overarching goal is to increase economic productivity, strengthen governance, and improve health and well-being for families in the implementation areas of Zindere Niger. Wadata's strategic approach outlines how the project's approaches and interventions will be used to achieve the project's objectives. Wadata's strategic approach combines several approaches to allow the project to address multiple audiences across the social ecological levels. So, you can see here there's kind of these four uh, sub approaches in the strategic approach. And here we can see kind of those four sub approaches in the circles. 
and you can see that they're all integrated, right? So they're working synergistically. Um, and then what we have in those white boxes, those are some of our specific Wadata activity. Also you can see is that sometimes these activities overlap with different strategic approaches, right? So the, the husband school here um, works in community SBC, but also community capacity strengthening. Um, and also another thing I just wanted to mention is that oftentimes these different platforms are working synergistically. Uh, sometimes there's members, for instance, uh, community influencers could also be members of husband schools. Uh, some people in our MMD groups are also part of the triad, uh, the triad group of volunteers. So there is that overlap there as well. And also just to note that a lot of these activities work together. So for instance, uh, husband schools and community influencers might mobilize community members to um, attend a talk about couples communication. So they work together there. Um, Husband schools and triad volunteers might work together to mobilize community members to donate supplies for cooking demonstrations. So I just wanted to point this out because uh, this, this strategy makes sure that everyone's working synergistically. None of this is um, in a silo. But this is just another visual representation. This is just part of it uh, because it is rather large, but we also mapped out each approach with the interventions, focus areas, and related Wadata SBC objectives here. We also created a summary table that presents the priority behaviors for each priority in influencing audience, the key behaviors and facilitators, the behavior change objectives, and more specific actions to facilitate the adoption of behavior change by audience. So here we can see that the directly affected audience, this is one of our primary groups here, is in that green bar and the behavior in the first column there, um, that is the priority behavior. And these are just things that we be found and listed in our problem tree, some of the barriers facilitating factors. And then you can see some of those actions and activities, right? Yeah, and I'll just add, if you um, do focus the online um, strategy planner, all these templates are in, uh, in that planner. Uh, and if you fill out everything in focus at the end, what you're gonna get is a, is a, um, is a, the strategy that's been formatted for you um, that you can download into a Word document and continue to, uh, to tweak and change as the uh, project goes along. Now we're on step four of the five steps. Um, and kind of going back to that house building analogy, at this point, your house is almost finished, but before you can move in, you have to have all your belongings delivered and you have to figure out where to put everything. Okay, so we've talked about com completing a situational analysis, developing your SBC objectives, and identifying the approaches, activities, and support materials you'll use for interventions. The next step is to determine how and when and by whom your SBC intervention will be implemented. To start, you can determine the sequence phasing, intensity, and reach of your activity. And all these decisions you have, uh, have made so far will help feed into developing the implementation plan. So to uh, things that you need to consider, you have to consider the sequence or the order in which your activities are gonna be implemented. Um, you have to think about phasing or dividing the implementation of the intervention into several stages over time in order to focus and not overwhelm your audience. Um, you also have to think about reach or the, the number of individuals or households uh, exposed to your uh, program's messages. And you have to think about intensity or the average number of times or households are exposed to the program's uh, messages. So this will all go into, uh, you'll think about all these things for your implementation plan. And, that, like I said, that implementation plan tells the who, the what, the when, the how much um, of your strategy. And it also covers the partner's roles and responsibilities, their activity, timeline and budget considerations. So it's, it's a lot. But the first thing we start to kind of think about uh, when we build any strategy, not just what DOT does, but any strategy um, is sequence. So implementation uh, doesn't mean that everything must happen all at the same time. Um, instead, uh, implementation should be kind of as a continuum of 
strategic action that needs to be taken over time. So planning how you'll sequence your program elements can help you um, be efficient and effective. So for instance, you'll need to assure that the interpersonal support materials are ready for use in time for the implementation of activities. Um, additionally, you'll need to start to uh, assure that the facility-based health workers are properly informed about community health worker pro uh, programs and also supplied with the necessary drugs and materials and trained um, uh, before the community health workers refer patients to them. So as part of developing your implementation plan, um, you kind of need to, you need to answer the following questions regarding sequence, uh, sequencing. So what are the activities that need to be implemented? And what are the intermediate steps for each activity? And what needs to happen before something else can happen? So additionally, based on um, the program's objectives, you may wish to determine the balance between reach or the number of people exposed and intensity, the average number of times an individual or a household are exposed. And due to resource constraints, there's a trade-off between the two. Typically, when reach is high, intensity will be low. If intensity is high, then reach will be low. Um, so for example, a program may choose to broadcast a message on all radio stations, so that would be a high reach, or concentrate on a few stations with more messages um, that reach a particular segment. That would be high intensity. So now that you have identified how you might go about sequencing your activities and other important factors, it's time to create your own implementation plan that details partners' roles, responsibilities, activities, timeline, budget, and management considerations. Um, so this was the template we used for Wadata, and it really helped us just think about that sequencing. Um, and other aspects of implementation that you really want to consider um, and are critical to plan for is the timing of activities against other events. Um, we all know that, that people have lives outside of SBC strategies and, and these projects, so we need to really be cognizant of that and how much time these projects could take. And we also need to make sure that the activities that we're proposing, as well as some other projects that might be in the zone, are mutually supportive. Um, and making sure, we really want to make sure that our programs are complementary. Okay, hey, so we've made it to step five, evaluation, and the good news is that your house has been built. So now it's time to inspect it. Um, throughout the pro uh, previous four steps, you made key decisions that will help with the monitoring and evaluation plan. And in this last step, you're gonna start to put together that monitoring evaluation plan that will help you compare the effects of your SBC intervention with uh, your program objectives and also identify factors that can help with um, uh, uh, help uh, with the, the program success. Um, so the good place to start in thinking about your monitoring evaluation plan is thinking about what you'll need to measure. And indicators are used to track the way in which a program evolves and to show changes in relevant program areas, including your SBC components. Um, measuring indicators can alert uh, managers uh, to any program changes or problems and at the end of the program indicators are also measured to validate the success and achievements of the intervention. So here you can see on this page we have process indicators and, and examples of outcome indicators um, and both of these are used to measure social and behavior change. Due to time I won't go into the different types of indicators but um, you can come back and, and review the slides if you wanted to. So here we are again with our theory of change. Remember I said that uh, steps often build off of each other's. So uh, the first step to creating program indicators for monitoring evaluation is to determine which characteristics of the program are most important to track. So referring back to our theory of change and your SBC objectives will help you determine what's important to track. Um, so, for instance, um, some process or outcome indi indicators we could use for this example uh, of this theory of change here is um, uh, the percentage of men and women who have a birth plan with identified transport and um, newborn uh, healthcare provider 
Um, or you could, you could, another indicator could be the proportion of health providers who participated in positive deviance groups who now provide quality counseling to parents with sick newborns. And you can look back at your problem tree you created. Um, so for instance, on the uh, Save the Children uh, Integrated SBC framework, all the determinants listed on this um, problem tree, all these different indicate or, or, uh, determinants can be turned into indicators. So um, for example, social norms around the, the priority behavior or the level of community social cohesion and capacity to absorb the SBC project activity um, or the extent of community leader consensus that most people in their community support um, if they support the priority behavior or not. Um, so all those, all those determinants can be turned into indicators. So in summary, using the five-step process and tools that we have outlined here will help you prepare and plan for SBC intervention through a comprehensive approach. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to, to um, Naomi now to tell you how Wadata is using um, their strategy. So since the Wadata uh, development of our SBC strategy, we have been very busy in the field, engaging our client agents, uh, the key community members, supporting or setting up new platforms that we think can lead to behavior change. So our polyvalent agents who monitor community level activities, always thinking about our SBC in the field. We developed individual guidelines per priority behavior cited in our SBC strategy. You can think of these guidelines as a stripped down SBC strategy per behavior to help keep the strategy element more digestible for our polyvalent agents. It's quite small, but you will see a version of this guideline on the upper left corner of the slide. Each mini SBC guide is made of five key elements. The priority behavior, the key audiences, including primary, secondary, and tertiary audiences, any key determinants shown in the formative research and included in our problem tree related to that behavior, key channels and activities related to the desired behavior. This includes an activity matrix showing who will be rich and when. And key indicators included in our monitoring and evaluation plan to measure that behavior change. So apart from the development of the SBC guides by priority behavior, some of the key SBC activities Wadata is currently implementing in the field are also uh, several training, such as the community action cycle, uh, human centered design and behavior, behavioral economics to increase the capacity of our community groups to lead their developing process. We have also conducted meetings with direct influencers such as husband schools that Megan has already spoke about, uh, some pregnant and lactating women groups, and also some traditional and religious the Wadata team also conducted some trainings to our polyvalent agents on how to set up the different community platforms that we will be working with cited in our SBC strategy and how to monitor progress over time. So we just finished setting up some of our nutrition support groups known as TRIAD and uh, husband schools that supports couple dialogue and the adoption of health practices. We have been also prioritizing key wash behaviors with support from water management committees to prevent the spread of COVID-19. 
some key activities include the distribution of soap uh, for hand washing. We also help the community members install the TP tap. They construct it themselves in, the, in their households. And also we have been answering key questions about COVID-19 during community group discussions. So, uh, and with that, I will say that we would like to close the presentation. Please feel free to contact us if you would like to see any of our tools or have some questions on how we are using our SBC strategy in the field. We will look forward to hearing from you. And we are very happy to answer most of your questions that have already been asked in the chat box. Thank you. Thank you very much to all our presenters. Uh, that was an excellent, uh, diverse uh, set of tools and steps. I would like to start, um, there was a question uh, about the tools, but uh, before I move towards that question, I'd like to start with, uh, in this area of context and tools, uh, asking Naomi, uh, in the work that you have done, uh, particularly in the, you know, in the case study, the Wadata project that we have been talking about, what are the tools that you feel have been the most helpful within the context that you're working? We had, as uh, Megan have highlighted, we had used 11 different tools to collect the data when we were uh, designing our SBC strategy. And we have the triad uh, that has been very, very much appreciative in the community. Uh, the community members have discovered it for the first time. Even the Wadata team has discovered it for the first time. So that tool is easy uh, to make the, your audience understand it, to cate categorize the behavior and also to understand which behavior are they prioritizing and even help you to get insights from the community on how to resolve this, uh, this, this behavior. So also one that I am using now after the strategy is developed is the uh, forms that we have been developing for uh, priority behaviors. So we have a list of almost more than 10 priority behaviors. And for each priority behavior, we develop that form that will help us to monitor how this behavior is being improved in the community. Are we meeting the target towards uh, reaching the indicator as we have set it in our log frame? So all these are really practical tools that the Wadata team is using that we will be very happy to share with other implementing partners so that they can look at how they can adapt them to their context. Thank you so much. Actually, those were some of the, the questions that um, people asked. We have Shivani uh, Saraf in uh, asked what are some of the 11 participatory research tools that you use? So you just went over it. And if you want to mention others, any of you, you can. And also um, people were asking uh, Alison, I think. Yeah, Kroshaw asked if it is possible to share a link to the Wadata SBC report and to some of the indicators of that SBC campaign. Yeah, Cecilia, I can jump in really, really quickly about some of the, first off, some of the other methodologies that we used. Um, again, they're all outlined in that guide, so please, please check it out on the ANH Academy website. Um, but, you know, I specifically remember one, one methodology that, that worked really well. We had a food attributes methodology where we developed these different food cards based on um, FAO guidelines in Zendare. And, um, we used these, these food cards to help ask different questions about what foods are appropriate or not appropriate for um, different groups of people, such as pregnant women, lactating women, children under two, and adolescent girls. And those are some of our pri uh, primary groups we plan to work with. 
And it, it really helped because it was a visual tool and um, you know, the population you're working with are not literate. So it was very helpful. And also just by being able to touch these cards and group them, it made it more fun and also um, really uh, uh, generated some good discussion. So we took a lot of um, notes during that formative research. I see Naomi laughing. We took a lot of notes on the discussions that were taking place among the community members using that tool. So that's just, that's just one example. And with regards to sharing the strategy, we can, we can do that, I, I'm pretty sure, yeah. Yeah, and Cecilia, to complain, to compliment Megan, sure we have uh, shared the guideline that we have developed in French and English, so people can see it on the website. And also, uh, we are really very uh, willing to help other projects that are using or starting developing their uh, SBC strategy with all our tools. And also we have a breakthrough research, which is coordinating um, a, a research about the SBC indicators. I see in the chat box, somebody asking about, uh, can we share some SBC indicators? So that will be also a great resource that we can share with them in our monitoring and uh, evaluation uh, plan. We have all our indicators and we have included all SBC related ones in our SBC strategy. And Breakthrough Research is now doing a work of compiling from the whole 3D FSA, uh, the SBC indicator. So that one also can be shared with those uh, willing to see more SBC indicators so that they can be inspired. Thank you. Um, I have two questions that I will ask together. Um, so Catherine Reeve asks, how long did this five step process take? Uh, and uh, Kathy Stephen asks, do you do all the step two activities in one workshop? How do you involve in the process and decision? I, let me see. I, must, I guess, how do you involve participants in the process and decisions? If, uh, if you have about a week uninterrupted, you can put together your strategy, at least uh, the, the basic one. Um, it took us a little bit longer for Wajata um, just because it's such a huge project and um, we had to get through all the, the, the nine different formative research um, reports and triangulate data. Um, so it took us a little bit longer um, and also working with the team back and forth. Now, you know, if this was non-COVID times, uh, Meg and, and possibly he would have gone back to Niger to work with the team on the strategy. Um, but given that we, we couldn't travel, everything was done long distance. So um, you would develop a strategy, the, the, the very basic draft, check in and back and forth with the team. Um, you probably heard Naomi say, um, uh, well, and I'll just say, Developing a strategy kind of never ends. It never ends until the pro project <laughs> ends because we keep going back and changing things. The, the more we learn about our audience, um, the more we uh, look at the process and how it's working, we make little tweaks and adaptations along the way. And I think that's what Naomi was talking about. Um, now they're actually in the implementation phase in the field and um, they're continuing to refine um, strategy. So the strategy we had a few months ago won't be the strategy that we'll have a few months from now. Imgard Jordan asks, what could be the role of positive deviance in your formative research? That's a good question. Uh, that's not a specific methodology that we, we used here. Um, most of the methodologies we used were very participatory with different visual aids. Uh, there were uh, some questions where we asked, you know, why why someone was or was not practicing a specific behave, uh, behavior, uh, but we didn't use the positive deviance methodology. It's not because that's not a great, another great methodology that you could use. It's more just because the population we were working with, uh, we wanted to make sure we were using a lot of visual aids. So some of those tools that we had, uh, you know, they, they, 
they just included a lot more aids and and we didn't want to i think we considered it i'm trying to remember i think we considered using it but since we yeah. already had 11 methodologies we uh <laughs> we, we cut it out <laughs> Yeah, you know, positive deviance is great. Uh, it is a labor and uh, kind of resource intensive. It takes a while to do as an approach. We just didn't have the luxury of time to in include it. Um, I think if you look at the guides, the uh, formative research guides that we've provided, um, you'll see that the 11 tools that we have used are not only great for formative research, this was also kind of in our decision making on what tools to include, um, not only great for capturing uh, insight during the, the formative phase, but can also, these polyvalent agents can use um, when they're out in the, in, the, in the community doing their work uh at any time for anything you know let's say they're out doing a, a a women's group or something like that or a husband schools they can pull out they can pull out those food attribute cards that um meg was uh was telling us about um and use them uh for for different everyday activities so i think uh you know part of our decision making process and what tools to include um, was we wanted the the methods to be able to kind of transverse from just a research activity to an everyday uh, participatory and learning activity. So uh, Naomi, uh, what what are what were some of the most surprising findings coming from your formative research? And this is a question from Rael Odengo. So. Um, the first finding that it really surprised even the Wadata as we are in our context, but we were so surprised that the early marriage is not only a concern from the parents, it's even the girls that want to go and marry. So before we always link the child marriage, to some assumptions regarding poor parents willing to marry their children very young so that they can have money and also they can discharge themselves from taking care of that girl. But during the assessments, and as Leonard said, we triangulate the results of the gender and youth stu uh, study with the SBC uh, research findings. So we find the, the same thing that the girls even are motivated to get married very young. So this is one thing that we want to address through community influencers, through the girls also, and now tackling the parents. So from our findings, now we, dis we, we distinguish how to address different kind of audiences with different kind of messages and at different time. So this is the first one. Uh, another key finding that we find during the formative research was uh, among community influencers at the community level, we do have teachers also. Before we, we put teachers aside, we are talking about both positive deviance, we are talking about role models, we are talking about uh, much of these key influencers and those that are behaving very good that you can take like a role model. But now we find in our uh, study that the teachers are really a good influencer of the community uh, children, in the community, they are well respected and also the community members value all the saying of the teachers. So we included also the teachers as our primary audience to address some of the key uh, behaviors that we would like to promote. So those are just um, two uh, findings that I highlight, but there is a lot of more uh, findings that surprised us regarding the exod rural. Uh, do you say in English? Yeah, the Back exodus. English. Yeah, exactly. So thank you. 
I don't know if Megan and Lynette can add some more things. Yeah, I, I can add one more that, that uh, helped us prioritize one of our behaviors. So we did a barrier analysis too around uh, exclusive breastfeeding, uh, sp specifically around that. And one finding that came out of that was uh, a lot of moms thought that uh, one of the reasons breastfeeding was hard uh, was because they were hungry um, or they were tired. And, you know, this is not, we, we know, you know, through science that women who are hungry or malnourished can still breastfeed and we promote that. But it came up so frequently in that, um, that part of our study that we said, you know, we need to really consider the, the nutrition of mothers and is this a problem in the zone? So we ended up making that uh, maternal nutrition uh, one of, and I, I forget how we, the exact wording of it, but uh, uh, we have a priority behavior around maternal nutrition because of that uh, finding that kept coming up, which was kind of surprised because it wasn't a specific, uh, uh, we use the barrier analysis to ask questions about exclusive breastfeeding, but maternal malnutrition came up a lot more there. So that was one that, that, that really stuck out uh, to me. We have a, a, a one uh, clarifying question from Irmgard Jordan. She, uh, um, the question is, it's not, for, it's not formative research done to generate the theory of change. Why should we do a TOC pr uh, prior to conducting the formative research? You know, so a lot of times when you're writing a, a project proposal, you have to create a theory of change. It's asked for, right? And uh, it's part of your proposal. So, you know, and that's, you're usually that, you're basing that off of secondary data analysis, data, DHS data, different, uh, you know, literature, peer reviewed literature. Uh, so, you know, it's based off of something. That's not to say that your theory of change uh, won't change uh, after you've conducted all your formative research. Um, the theory of change for the program is one thing, and that's what's included in that proposal. Um, we, uh, with Danta, and what, what we usually do at Save the Children is create a theory of change around the social and behavior change objectives that we have. So while the program might have a theory, a, a large theory of change, um, we'll have a smaller one on the, on the social and behavior change. Um, and, you know, a theory of change is a, is a tool. It helps guide you. It shows you those pathways. Um, that's not to say that uh, it always holds true. Uh, and that's why, uh, you know, social and behavior change practitioners, we have to be nimble. Um, and we have to adapt, and some, sometimes we have to tweak things. I remember I, I took once a, an SBC training, and even just doing the process of creating a theory of change was very informative. Um, so I think it's, it's good to be able to do it ahead, but then, like you say, things will change as you learn more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Mary Parker asks, what methods do you recommend particularly to get at social issues like social norms, family systems, community dynamics that influence behavior? One of the tools that uh, we used for Wadata and that's in that, that formative research guide that is uh, available to you is uh, the Pathways to Change game. Um, this game, uh, if anybody is familiar, uh, Joseph Petraglia actually put this game together. Um, uh, and you can use it for all sorts of different things. We used it to try and get uh, to uh, insights about the social norms. Uh, so the kind of, co kind of questions we were asking uh, participants that would do this game, uh, you know, they had to create uh, audience personas and the, the audience had to go uh, from the start to the end of the game and make all sorts of different decisions. So some of the questions that we were asking during that game uh, helped get to some of the social norms. We did uh, gender resource mapping too, which I think also oh, yeah. got, yeah, got at some social norms. And basically 
what what we did we worked with different uh, age groups of of girls and boys and also men and women um and we had them draw a picture of uh let's say i th i think that we did it for adolescent girls girls you know let's just say 14 to 15 i, I think it was more than that but and they drew they actually drew a picture of what an adolescent girl looks like um, in their community mm -hmm. and um then we asked different questions about you know what resources are available to you and why where can you go in the community and why and they actually drew pictures on different parts of the, the they had big parchment papers uh, uh, of those different resources that were available to them and why and that also helped us kind of think about some of the the social and gender norms that were available and we asked the same types of questions for the the four different um, audience of the four different participant groups we were working with. So it was a group of men, a group of women, adolescent boys and adolescent girls. And it was again, a, a really visual tool too. And I mean, another thing, uh, not to digress, but another thing I learned through this process is that Nigerians are quite the artists, you know, they drew uh, some really great pictures here that were also really informative to us. That was just another, another example of the tool that was looking at norms. This question oh, is uh, from Ermgard Jordan again. At which stage do you, uh, do I include the aspect of social mobilization and community engagement? Maybe it's like a clarifying question in the process. I am one to believe that uh, as soon as you get the money <laughs> for the project, you should start engaging with the community, um, you know, early in the process and throughout the process. Uh, especially if you're thinking about, you know, creating a, a project, and most projects are, you know, sustainab sustainability uh, of the intervention. So you, you want you want that community community members to be part of the process throughout the whole entire process. Well, I see that um, Ermgard, who asked the question, has a hand raised, so maybe I'll I'll let her. Ask a question. Uh, sorry, Nadat, it was more or less a teasing question um, because I think that social mobilization is as important as a good guideline on how to do social mobilization. And we often neglect that we really have to find good people who are able to communicate with the communities. And sometimes we somehow think that all our guidelines and the materials are more important than the people we are working with. So I'm wondering, um, still at the same time, how can we ensure that we select the best people to apply the guidelines and the materials, which may be great, um, but that they are actually then able to initiate the behavior change you would like to. So um, I'm still wondering, but at the same time, of course, it was a teasing question, but um, how, at which process do we include the staff we would like um, to, to use and apply um, the materials we have? So for short term question, I think um, we start social mobilization even during the proposal development, because we do go to the communities to know their realities, to know uh, their need and build on that to elaborate our proposal. After that, we come, we do all this research. We have some findings that we should address and now we continue working on our theory of change, seeing if really our pathway that we have set are, are working or we have to revise them. And now uh, we develop all our tools um, based on the priority behaviors and how we want to address them. Once this is done, we keep on finding good people that have a background that we want when hiring them. But you, we are using on Wadata polyvalent agents. And you can agree with me that a polyvalent agent is not a polyvalent when you are hiring him you will make him polyvalent during the time when you will, you will be teaching him how to implement health activities, agriculture activities, wash activities, resilience activities, governance activities. So he will become polyvalent during the time, but not at his hiring 
time. So this one is really a good process. That's why I talk about most of the trainings that we are, you, we are conducting based on the tools that we have developed. So the community action cycle is really a very big process and good one to help our community uh, agent, field agent, to know how to approach the community. So which kind of uh, messages you need to give, which kind of behavior you need to show first before even convincing some other audience. Mm. Because talking is not sometimes the thing that you use to convince, but the, your attitude, the way you behave, the community people are really looking at our development agents in the field on how they behave, how they work, and so that they can learn, they can also uh, uptake the behaviors. It's really a very big process since the proposal development through the life of the project and also uh, our personal, our personal attitudes and also the use of the different guides that we are developing is a contributing factor to achieving successful SBC uh, projects. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to our presenters and to our audience for participating. Uh, and with that, we conclude this third webinar.